projects, both public and private. And um, at the moment, she's helping Be Calm and Be Gans, um, sort of revise and update their um, Living Collections Toolkit. So I'll hand over to Andrea. Thank you, Cherie. Um, and thanks, everyone. And I might even do a bit of a tag team here with um, John Arnott on this particular one. I'll just share my screen. Let's just make it so. I'd like to still see people. OK, I can still see you. This is good. OK, um, can everyone see my screen? Um, so today I am introducing um, the Living Collections Toolkit that me and my team have been working with, with Begans. And the toolkit isn't ready yet because what we've found out, the more we dig into it, the more complex this is and the more um, intricacies we've got to resolve. But at the moment, it's heading to be a really fabulous resource. Um, for all botanic gardens of all shapes and sizes, but particularly smaller gardens that are perhaps less um, well resourced. Um, and we've got a working group that's got, um, we've got John Arnott, we've got Cherie, we've got Donna Thomas from Ballarat, Tex Moon, Dan Long Rangers, Peter Symes from Cooktown, John um, Sandham from Adelaide, Amanda Shade from Kings Park, Emil Jensen from ANBG, Wolfgang Bopp from Christchurch, and I've probably forgotten someone. And if I have, I'm sorry. Um, and tell me who you are in the chat. Um, so just quickly, I'm going to do a little introduction to what the toolkit is. Um, prioritize, and then I'm going to talk about prioritizing your collections, because um, this is where I think the toolkit will be really useful for particularly bigger gardens. And then I want to introduce a concept John Arnott and I have been knocking around about trying to get to grips with what different size botanic gardens can contribute and ways of categorising them. Um, producing the Living Collections Plan and then a quick wrap up of what's in it for your garden. Um, and this is where I'm going to struggle because my notes are over here. I'm going to see if I can set it up so I can see everything at once and I probably can't. I might just have to make it so I can't see you guys. Sorry, everyone. This is where. OK, let's see how it goes. Hopefully everyone can still see me. Um, so living collections, we know that they're the cornerstone of botanic gardens. And for probably a lot of you, you will live and breathe this. But um, for some gardens, particularly small ones, you can really struggle with what a botanic garden is and what a living collection is. Um, you might be getting away with just volunteers or horticulturalists and a couple of labourers. And this is who the toolkit really will be helping. It'll help you develop a living collection, focus your focus on what you can do, then do well, rather than getting overwhelmed by the complexity of it. And we're working with um, Wendy from Ant House and Isaac from, I'm sorry, John, I've forgotten the name of Isaac's company, um, to produce this into a web-based um, tool. So we're going to have lots of information, step-by-step -step guidance on what living collections are, what information you can need to collect, what process you should be following, who should you be talking to, what level of consultation is appropriate. Um, we're going to take you back to Collections 101. So if you really don't know where to start, this, this toolkit is going to step you through exactly what you need to be doing. Um, and then there'll be options to go in and come out of it. It'll step you through what you're going to be doing, you can chip away at it. You can have multiple people working on it or one person working on it. But the idea is this is something you could chip away at for a, over a long period of time if needed. And it might be for small gardens, you'd actually prefer to get an external consultant or facilitator in to manage the process. But even if you do that, it should still cost a lot less than um, if you'd just ask someone to do it from scratch because all the building blocks will be there. We're going to be providing supplied text and then things you can edit so that a lot of the document, particularly the technical side, will be written for you. <laughs> and um, it's going to be something that we've put a bit of work into looking at what is world's best practice. So the idea is even if you are a small garden with one horticulturalist, you can still have a document and still be working to world's best practice. We're just going to, rather than expecting you to do it for your whole collection, we're going to narrow in your focus. So there's going to be three steps on how the toolkits works. The first step is working out what you're going to collect. Um, and this can be quite complicated. Um, I'm sorry, 
it really is bothering. Cherie, would you mind turning on your camera? Because I can't see anyone, but I can see your blank screen. <laughs> Thank you. That's better. I can see a face. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> um, so working out, um, first we're going to talk you through what you're going to collect, because this is where I think um, as horticulturists, we get a bit kid in the candy store. There's so much we can collect. There's so much depth in our gardens. And we're really with this toolkit, we're looking at a diff the difference between your gardens and a living collection. You can have an amazing variety of plants in your garden, but collections are curated. Collections are actively managed for integrity and to tell a story and to be of scientific or educational use. So what are you actually focusing those curatorial um, resources on rather than your sort of general living collection? We're then going to talk you through actions for developing and managing the collections and the actions will provide a list of actions. You can edit, you can choose which ones are applicable, but they're going to start with the assumption that you, you are different gardens are at different levels. So there's going to be a different set of recommended actions for a garden that's starting, that's being established. A garden that's perhaps been around for a long time, but doesn't really actively manage their living collections as opposed to their horticulture. And then there'll be a diff um, very different set of collections, um, actions again for a big garden, a like Ballarat or a Sydney or Brisbane. Though some of those gardens may not want to use the toolkit. And then you'll step through actually producing your own living collections plan. And the idea is once you've answered all the questions, you've filled in the bits that need filling in, the end of the day, you can push a button, it'll spit out a PDF and you have a living collections plan all beautifully graphically designed. Um, but we take all of that pain out of it for you. And what we're really wanting to do with this is focus on quality over quantity. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is what are we going to collect? And when we're doing this, um, developing this, we did a high level literature review where we did an internet scrape. We reached out to organisations and we had a look at 27 different collections plans for botanic gardens, for museums, um, for um, other types of living collections, because living collections include zoos and aquariums, had a really fascinating conversation with someone at Melbourne Zoo. And there were a few principles that really came out um, as sort of the foundations of collections curation. You need to know who you're holding the collection for. And the general principle is collections are held in trust for the public. You need to know why, what is the purpose of your collection? And Melbourne Zoo is really strict on this because it's a big deal to introduce a new species there. So they really need to know it fits with their wider purpose. You need to know what plants you have in the garden and where possible their provenance. You need to know where your plants are located. You need to know when the plants were added, when there were diseases, when they were removed. And you need to know how you're going to apply best principles. And this is what the Collections Toolkit is going to help you do. Um, step through all of these and provide as much help and guidance as possible. So the first thing it's going to do is talk, force you to have a bit of a look at your garden's collections priorities. And these are the priorities for your whole garden. And we all know of collections as far as, you know, taxonomic and geographic, um, display, cultural collections. But this is stepping back from the types of collections to the why are you collecting them? You can have collections for education, children's garden, therapeutic gardens, plants for the home garden. They could be conservation, which is sort of the pinnacle of botanic gardens work. Research, this can be botanical, it could be horticultural, it could be for climate tolerance. It could even spread into medicine or economic, particularly if you're, say, an institution garden connected to a university. Cultural collections, um, and this includes um, plants of importance to First Nations people. They can be for social benefit. Um, the begonias at Ballarat are a classic one where they have a really strong um, social connection to a particular plant group. Display, can't underestimate the power of beauty to engage people in plants. Could be to tell a story. Could be to provide local relevance. Or it could be for environmental benefits. And I mean, all, plant, all collections should provide environmental benefits, but it could be a collection that's all about shade trees or erosion control or something like that. So we've developed a collections tool, which I'm not going to show you today because it's still a work in process, but it basically provides a um, impartial way of going through and working out what are the priorities of your garden? What might you want to collect and how well do those two align? And as well as the purpose, we're also looking at the practicalities of gardens management there as well. So 
um, collections that are a really poor, really high biosecurity risk or climate risk, um, or you just simply don't have the staff to maintain. The tool, the assessment tool takes all of that into consideration as well. And once you've worked out what you're going to collect, we're going to develop, we're going, you're going to work through the actions for developing the collections, actions around things like record keeping and climate appropriateness and displaying your collections. And over time, we might expand it to include all sorts of things, even things like nursery management or, you know, if you do want to go on collecting trips, which not all gardens will want to do. But one of the things that really came out strongly as we we're working through this um, is the fact that not all botanic gardens are the same. There's a massive difference between, say, your little Kyneton or Gisborne Botanic Gardens and Royal Botanic Gardens Victoria. And then you've got every sort of um, everything in between as well. And in order to try, there was a really great statement made at the, um, there was a workshop on accreditation where um, Maranoa Gardens were talking a few weeks ago. And what really came out of that strongly and beautifully was that you don't have to be Melbourne to be a botanic garden. You don't have to be Sydney. You don't have to be Kew. You don't even have to be Ballarat or Geelong. You can still be a botanic garden and be smaller. And that's sort of what that priorities is about. What we're going to be doing is saying, okay, if you think you can do one collection really, really well and the rest are just landscape displays, that's fine. So what we're introducing here, and I'd be interested to know in people's thoughts in the chat, is a way of categorising botanic gardens um, based on your resources, based on what you're able to achieve. And we can then sort of set goals and actions that are within your resources. So you can do less, do it well, that quality over quantity. So um, this is a list, um, this is the um, UNESCO list from the Botanic Gardens Conservation Strategy in 1989, but this is the commonly list of defining characteristics for botanic gardens. And I've been using this slide and this slide in presentations for years. Um, and what this shows is that list of um, defining characteristics for botanic gardens and how well it lines up for particularly regional botanic gardens in Australia, from sort of the always down to the not at all or rarely. You know, there's no regional gardens in Victoria, to the best of my knowledge, that have herbaria, for example. It's all the big city ones. And taking that and going to the next step, it's like, well, you could actually apply this to different gradings of gardens, tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four. And what we're thinking here is tier one is no worse than tier four. Tier four is no better than tier two. It's just about putting um, a bit of a bracket around what gardens do and where they should be focusing their efforts. Um, so tier one, all of them would have a reasonable degree of permanence open to the public monitoring of the plant collections. You're all doing that. Adequate labelling of the plants, you know, tier ones may have some plants labelled, they want more, but tier two's probably got adequate labelling and then exchange of seed and other materials. Tier three starting to get into, you know, more of this sort of um, communication, engagement with BGANs, all of that. Proper documentation of the collections. And then tier four, I'm also calling mentoring a uh, mentoring organisation. These are the these are Melbourne, Sydney, AMBG, Adelaide, Kings Park, Christchurch. These are ones that are in a position to provide resources to tier one, two, and three. And they sort of roughly line up based on the resources from a council run garden with minimal resources, possibly historic, primary focus is public amenity, something like Kyneton, to, to you know, council or institutional, adequately resourced public amenity with some horticultural botanical focus. So probably more like Aubrey, say there. Tier three would be something like Ballarat or maybe the Systems Garden at Melbourne University there. And then tier four is obviously your major city capital gardens there. And we're going to be basing some of the um, recommendations and actions in the toolkit around these tiers. And the other thing with these tiers are, if you're looking at it and going, oh, we're a tier two, but we think we could be a tier three, the toolkit's going to be one of the things that helps you step up to that next tool, next tier and sort of get your house in order. So it's meant to sort of help help you rise through the tiers if you want, but also just focus your resource if you want, if you're quite happy with the position you're holding. And from there, um, 
you'll actually fill in the, the dot points, answer the questions, and it will produce a living collections plan. You'll work through the toolkit online, and in the end, you will have a nice shiny document, something like this, because we don't have the graphics done yet. Nice cover, overview of what collections are, little snapshot of each of your collections, nothing too detailed, and then the actions at the back of it. So that's what we've been working on at the moment. Um, and John, if you had anything to add to that. Uh, uh, look, poss poss possibly Andrea, it's, um, that, that was a really good in, in introduction. We've been, suffice to say, we've been kind of grappling at the, um, at the, just just with the diversity of botanic gardens. And, and we, we're hoping that this sort of tier one, two, tier three, tier four <clears throat> helps gardens to sort of identify where they sit within within that that uh, uh, continuity of, 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 of botanic gardens. Um, and the other thing that we were, uh, and I think we're still grappling with a little bit, is um, uh, the a, a collection could be 15 plants or it could be 1500 or it could be 2000. So there's an incredible diversity of scale of, 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 of collections, um, which we're, uh, yeah, just just wrestling with a little bit in, in, in as to how to contextualise that in a, in a in a meaningful way uh, through the through the living collections toolkit. But I um, mean, put simply, it's it's for some gardens, it, this is an opportunity to put the botanic into the, the botanic gardens through living collections planning processes. Yeah. Uh, and for other gardens, it's an opportunity to actually completely be objective about how their their tracking tip, tier three, tier mm. four gardens. I think this will be a valuable tool because it asks some interesting questions about, well, okay, you've got these collections, but how are they performing against your objectives? How are they performing against um, uh, your collection priorities? Yeah. Um, so there's a bit of an evaluation uh, 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 tool associated with this as well, which I think is going to be really interesting for gardens all, uh, of, of all shapes and sizes. Um, uh, and and uh, Andrew, I'm not sure whether you're going to be keep, mm -hmm. keeping going, but I mean, a a Andrea and the team uh, have been doing a mountain of work on on, on this. That there could have even been a little bit of scope creep along the along the way, um, but it's. It's looking really promising as to be as to being something which um, can assist gardens of all shapes and sizes to yep. um, focus on their living collections agenda and to sharpen it up or yeah. you know, pose some questions. It's yeah. I'm really pleased of where it's sitting, Andrew. Yeah, good. Thank you, John. And that's where I realise I haven't really spoken about it for you know what's in it for your garden. And I I think for the tier one and twos, like John said, particularly tier one, it's a chance to put the botanic in the botanic garden to go from just being a public park to being a botanic garden. It'll be a really useful tool for talking to stakeholders, for talking to your managers, for, you know, pe helping people to understand that, yes, you are a botanic garden and you are doing this work. Um, and I know there's been examples like Melbourne Ute Zoo, for example, did really incredible conservation work on one species, you know, and that is fine. So it will, it will help with all of that. Um, and for tier three and four gardens, they may only use the assessment tool. They may not use it to produce their plan, but it's the assessment tool. Um, we've done the research. We've looked at what people are doing around the world. So it's sort of been a really great chance to take a step back and going, okay, what is best practice here for management? So for the smaller gardens, it's going to get you a collections plan um, that's top quality with the least amount of pain. And for the bigger gardens, um, it's a chance to objectively um, look at where you're headed and um, focus your resources where they where they matter and where they can do the most good. Yeah, uh, and and suffice you. to say, suffice to say, it's a it's a, a hell of a step up just in terms of presentation and technology for from that sort of paper thing that we produced on it as a in a word document yeah. ten or twelve years yeah. ten or twelve yeah. years ago. It's uh, yeah. yeah, it's unrecognisable. Yeah. We are rolling across some of the content from the last one. So if you've been using the last one, don't worry, we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but the where technology's gone these days, we, it allows us to do so much more for you. Yeah. Thank you. Over to you, Cherie. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea and John. 
for that and um, great presentation. So a lot to um, think about. But yeah, if you've got any questions, um, yeah, pop them in the chat or yeah, just hold them to the end of the session and um, we'll get to them. Um, next Karina, up. So yeah. it might just be worth putting putting it in context as well that this was um, when Emma was uh, back in the chair of, of, of BCAM, we put the Living Collections Review as our um, priority project for, for, for BCAM for 2023. Um, and it's it's just lovely to see that that's been uh, realised. And, and it, it's probably also worth noting that we got um, some really generous funding from, uh, yeah. from the state government in Victoria to to support support this work. Yeah. Um, and uh, but yeah, funded by state government in Victoria, but rolled out to the broader, um, yeah. the broader network. So the focus has been slightly more Victorian for that reason, and just I, I'm Melbourne based, so that's that's my main pool of knowledge. But um, we are developing it in such a way as it would be useful across climatic zones across the country and into New Zealand. Yep, yep. It, it's the globe, Andrea. Pardon? <laughs> the globe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> No, that's all good. Yeah, no, it's great. And it's a great project to be part of. So um, yeah, and our next presenter, Emma, was um, yeah, the, the founding um chair of BCAM. So um she's done a yeah, amazing job in the past few sort of years. Um so Emma is a senior regional advisor for Auckland Council, and um, she's been working in botanic gardens with um, conservation and threatened plants, I think, for over 10, 10 years. And um, she was a key contributor at the 7th Botanic Global Botanic Gardens Congress last year, I think in September that was, um, and did some collection-based um, workshops there. So um, she's going to chat to us today about those findings and the common themes for us. So thank you, Emma. Thanks, Sheree. Thanks for having me back here at the Be Calm Forum. It's really nice to be here. And um, yeah, today I'm going to present a bit of a um, summary of the workshop that um, I led with John and Andrea and some of our colleagues at Missouri Botanic Garden. Um, and this was... Um, primarily for us as um, BEGANS members, a way of collecting information and tapping into all of your brains to help inform what um, Andrea and the team have been working on with the Living Collections um, tool, which is really, really exciting to see. So, um, sorry, this all this data is so delayed. It was seven, almost eight months ago that the Congress was um, on, but, um, if you weren't at the Congress, um, here's a bit of an overview of what the workshop entailed. Um, the goal was to really drill down into some of the key themes that we thought were important for living collections to be aware of and kind of pull out some of the challenges and the opportunities um, that, that we're facing. Um, in the end, we had over 100 people in that workshop, which was fantastic. We saw a really great representation of um, the different roles that we have in botanic gardens from horticulturalist to scientists to kind of visitor and engagement um, experts. We also had a bit of a range from um, major capital city gardens down to the, the small smaller gardens. Um, when we asked the participants what their top um, goal of their living collections was. It was quite surprising that 30% said display, um, but conservation was kind of not far behind. And maybe that is a, um, a difficult question to ask, just one. Um, I know when I worked at Auckland Botanic Gardens, it was actually very difficult to pull apart some of those um, key goals. And we also got a bit of an idea of our participants, whether they had a living collections plan or not. So uh, not unsurprisingly, there were quite a, um, more than 50% did. Um, 22 of our participants didn't, and most of those were in that smaller regional botanic garden space. So it's great to see that the tool that's been developed um, has really kept that type of um, botanic garden in mind. These were our four key themes that we explored. So um, each kind of participant group only focused on one of these. So they really had, I think they had about an hour or so to really delve deep into these topics. So the first one was around research and conservation horticulture. Then we looked at building and landscaping with collections. 
attracting training and retaining quality horticulturists, which became quite a theme throughout the whole Congress. Other workshops like the Conservation Horticulture one really um, tapped into this type of thing as well. And then we looked at the overall value of living collections in a botanic gardens, and that one really um, explored some very interesting ideas. So in terms of research and conservation horticulture, there were some very um, common themes across gardens of scale and across the globe. Um, protocols and permissions was probably one of the biggest barriers to being um, able to carry out this type of work. Um, my own experience knowing that going through protocols, developing those, getting permission takes up almost a, a big majority of, of that planning phase of doing any kind of field collections and things like that. And that's um, often those permissions are quite specific around how you can and can't use the material, where that material will end up. Um, and so that, that can sometimes limit how, how we end up using the material in our collections. One of the other areas was around genetic representation. Um, so, of course, if we want useful conservation collections, we need the largest genetic representation as possible. And what we see is those larger gardens that have resourcing and they have the um, herbarium and seed bank facilities, those other kind of conservation tools other than a living collection can do that quite well. When we've got smaller gardens or smaller resourcing, they're unable to do that on their own. And that really feeds nicely into the idea of meta collections, um, where we see value when we scale up the collections across multiple gardens. And if you're at the last BCAM forum, um, Amelia Jensen, Martin Jensen talked about uh, the native guava in New South Wales and um, running a meta collection across botanic gardens in New South Wales and, and having very important collections, not necessarily all in one place, spreading that risk. Um, and so seeing more of this and this being led by those bigger gardens to incorporate the smaller regional gardens will add value to all in a kind of a network. We also see challenges where material often just remains vested in the country of origin. That often ties back to permissions. Um, it's often difficult to send material across the globe, whether that's biosecurity related, whether that is permissions around Indigenous communities wanting it to remain in the country of origin. And so we need to be a bit clever about how we manage those collections. Um, one of the ways I've overcome that is having better collections within country, but using gardens that are kind of outside the range of Myrtle Rust, for example, and, and putting those collections in a, a less risky place. One of the hot topics um, of the conference was around records and um, this group discussed having records that are really um, being critical to what we do and making them part of our KPIs. And often we see our staff kind of seeing this as the nice to do, but not the must do and our, our collections will never be um, as useful for research and conservation if our records aren't robust and, and full of rich information. And finally, this group also touched on looking at how relevant collections can be and how they can be made available to research. And when you look at the scale of different gardens, um, those gardens without uh, research staff need to look and explore partnerships or networks like the International Plant Sentinel Network, um, facilitating students, universities, those kind of um, research institutions to use their collections and not just for tax, things like taxonomic studies and botanical ecological studies, all those, those are valuable, but sometimes they might be used for kind of quirky things like um, one of the projects I facilitated was uh, studying fibres for tarpa cloth, which is like a traditional um, fabric. You might be looking at the diet of some interesting animal and providing seed or leaves or flowers to that. So the the world's kind of your oyster in terms of what you can facilitate when you don't have staff to carry out that work. The second theme was around building and landscaping with collections. And one of the biggest challenges is knowing about how to grow those plants. Um, when we're introducing new conservation material into collections, we often don't know very much about their growing conditions. And so that, that can be really challenging. And then the other 
component of that is can we find a place in our collection where it makes sense to incorporate that in and often um, sometimes our kind of our thematics or our plant collection guidelines might be very specific so looking at ways to broaden those thematics so that we can um, incorporate some of these these special plants that we're introducing into the collections. Um, another topic around this area was around involving staff in developing plans or documentations. And so one example is this living collections tool that Begans has been working on. Another one is kind of master planning. We often find when those plans are done in isolation of um, our horticultural teams, there are lots of challenges that then arise when they come to put those into place. So having all staff or a diversity of staff representation in those conversations is really critical to ensuring the success of implementing those plans. And finally, this group explored the ever-changing world, which is pathogens, pests and diseases, and how to manage our collections, particularly those conservation collections, with um, new arriving things into them. It's really difficult to manage in, in the garden sometimes, and the example this group discussed was around myrtle rust um, and maintaining myrtaceae collections. And so we probably need to think in terms of those meta collections and using the resources of larger gardens and building capacity into smaller gardens around what, what ways we can best maintain those collections. The third topic was around attracting, training and retaining quality horticulturalists. Um, and I think probably the biggest message that came out of these discussions was botanic gardens need formal training. No country, no garden of size um, or scale seems to be getting the right type of people through their kind of recruitment process. And so that really highlights there's some kind of gap, um, whether that's through our current training providers, um, you know, TAFEs or um, primary institutions doing these trainings. So we had during the conference, we did hear a little bit from some of these big gardens in America that they're thinking about developing training programs, um, at least the content, so that they could be uh, rolled out to um, other countries. And, and delivering training is really important locally. Um, we don't want, we want a diversity of staff across the globe, and, and that's really important. Um, there have been some great programs. Um, out in the UK, but you know, travel, um, those kinds of barriers um, will stop people wanting to join the industry if there isn't localised training. So that's a big one. And I know it's been talked about and began a lot um, over the last decade or so. So um, now's the time, I think, to kind of put some real thought into how we might be able to get this type of thing off the ground. One of the um, things that was discussed a lot was um, showcasing and packaging the intrinsic and extrinsic values of roles. Um, our participants talked a lot about the value of connecting with people, about doing formal and informal training, um, going to presentations and workshops, attending conferences. All of these things don't necessarily um, they don't add to salary, but they are things that are incredibly valued to the overall um, professional development of our staff. And so I think um, this group really wanted to highlight that we should talk about this more. It's something that just happens, but it's not something that is explicitly discussed, um, you know, when you're doing recruitment and things like that. So we also saw conservation horticulture becoming a really prominent term and I think we're seeing a bit of a social shift and advocacy within our um, industry to promote this as a really exciting um, and important career path and so I think using this term will start to spark some real interest in um, new people joining the industry. And then I think the final thing, which um, if you went to the Congress, you probably will resonate with is building connections with people is highly valued. I think uh, this is the reason why a lot of people work in this industry. They're passionate about plants, but they love um, connecting with people, sharing their knowledge, 
uh, gaining knowledge from others. And so that value, I don't think, should be underestimated. And, and that group um, really strongly communicated that point as well. The final group explored the value of living collections. And um, one of the um, most important things we saw was uh, re-education, um, often when we see changes in our organisation, whether that's structurally or um, people, we're continually having to re-educate about our purpose. And Capital City Gardens gave quite good feedback that they've done that well and they don't seem to have to do too much of that re-education anymore. But for regional gardens, they're seeing that that is still a, a challenge for them. And like Andrea mentioned, having those um, documents, those documentations, whether it's a living collections policy, guideline, whatever you want to call it, um, having master plans creates that real foundation and a place for common knowledge. Um, it's great that your all staff can, can speak to those documents and, and build that um, reputation and, and understanding within our organisation. Well, through kind of those partnerships and collaborations with research and conservation, it also starts to build those advocates with out, outside of our botanic gardens team, outside of the immediate team. And when we see staff move into kind of environmental departments and other parts of our organisation, we can see some real benefit in those people being champions for botanic gardens as well. Um, this group talked a little bit about um, sharing the value of living collections with our visitors, which is a huge part of what we do around education. Um, and in most gardens, we take a layered approach. We use things like interpretive signage and social media and websites and tours and workshops and things like that. And so why wouldn't we also use that kind of layered approach within, within our organization? We've got plans to share, we might give them talks, um, we might take them on tours. Those are some of the best ways to really hone in that value when they see and meet the people doing the work. So across all of those themes, we saw some, some uh, similarities come through um, and everyone wanted more time, but time is a finite resource. I can't give that to anyone, unfortunately. Um, even the big gardens where they've got 200 staff, they still want more time, they want more resources. And so we need to be clever about how we're spending our time. Um, and something like this Living Collections tool that Begans is developing is a way of doing that, is a way of reducing the amount of time we're spending on creating documents, um, which frees up our time to be doing other things within our collections. So meta collections, really important. I think we're going to see more and more of this coming through and um, great to hear more of those stories to understand how they work, what coordination is needed um, and to not underestimate that there, there is some resourcing that's required to kind of lead that or coordinate that. Collaboration is key um, and collaboration not only to achieve conservation and research, but also for our, our staff and maintaining their interest in what they do um, and creating those really well-rounded horticulturists that we want in our teams. Being part of networks, um, again, that's around that people connection and, and Begans is doing that, a fantastic job of creating professional networks for our, our um, teams to be a part of. And um, there's also those BGCI networks that we can be a part of. So don't underestimate the value of those, whether that's joining in, um, just connecting with one or two people that you might virtually meet. Um, and we also saw some commonality in capacity building is um, using uh, those large gardens as places where all the, the kind of complex information might be or a way of doing things and bringing those smaller gardens that don't necessarily really have the resourcing to deliver projects but can contribute in some way, shape or form um, builds to our overall contribution to kind of research and conservation. So that's a real whirlwind of um, what happened in that workshop. Um, you don't have to remember anything I said because we've written it all up into an article. So after this workshop on the BGCI website will be kind of a news article with a 
um, recording of my talk today and the full almost 3,000 word write-up of all the notes that um, we collated from that workshop. And then in a couple of weeks' time in the Botanic Gardener magazine from Began's, there'll be a, a shorter, more condensed version of that um, write-up. So check those out if you're interested. That's all from me. Thanks, Emma. That was um, yeah, fantastic and great to um, to see some of those themes come through um, from the workshop. Um, I attended a few of those workshops, so it's really great way to um, network and meet a lot of people from all over the world as well. So um, great to hear how they go about doing things in their gardens. Um, so um, next up, we've got um, Damien uh, Wrigley from um, he's from Sydney, so he's recently been appointed Manager of Living Collections and Conservation in Sydney and he's going to share his vision and role um, for advancing the conservation programs over their three botanic gardens, um, Mount Anan, Mount Tuma and Sydney. So um, thank you Damien for joining us. Thanks Sheree, can you see that okay? Yeah that's great. Excellent. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm recently appointed as a manager of living collections and conservation for the gardens. Um, so I'm thrilled to be joining the team. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge the Dharawal people as the traditional owners of the country I'm on today and pay my respects to elders past, present and extend that respect to any First Nations people on the call. Um, so what I'll do today is I will just touch on the diversity of our collections, the themes and key collections um, across the Botanic Gardens of Sydney, the challenges we face and the importance uh, to conservation, horticulture and native plant conservation. Um, I'll look I guess one way to start is uh, the way we're defining it is a living collections is a group of plants curated, databased, grown or stored for a defined purpose, including for reference, research, conservation, education or ornamental display. So for us, it includes the nursery potted collections and also the curated live germplasm, such as seeds, embryos, tissue cultures, freeze dried fungi and cultures of symbiotic organisms that are all held in long term storage for future use. So quite a lot. So just a, a quick recap for anyone who is new to the Botanic Garden space. Um, the Royal Botanic Gardens in Sydney is the oldest botanic garden and the oldest continuing scientific institution in Australia, founded in 1816. It sits on the lands of the Gadigal people um, and it covers approximately 30 hectares with an additional 34 throughout the domain's urban parklands. So we have key collections in Sydney and these include begonia, ferns, orchids, palms, cigarettes, and these are all based on taxonomic um, classifications. Then we also have cycads that are held for conservation purposes and camellias for their heritage and ornamental properties. Um, and the domain has uh, one main key collection, which is the tree arboretum, um, and we'll be having an important uh, wild area, which will have a focus on rewilding parts of the landscape to pre-European uh, flora. And I apologise, I've got a little friend who's come to visit me. Um, so moving west to um, the Blue Mountains Botanic Gardens, Mount Tomar, it sits on the Darug traditional owner's lands and Tomar actually stands for tree fern, which dominates the surrounding rainforests. Um, the gardens were opened in 1987 and they include 28 hectares of cultivated gardens and approximately 200 hectares of sandstone woodland and gullies that are managed for conservation. So key collections here um, come from cool climate species uh, from South Africa, South America and a small number of other northern hemisphere species. These include aces, camellias, conifers, heath and heather, narcissus, puya, rhododendron, and of course, the wallaby pine. Also out west uh, on the lands of the Durrell traditional owners, um, there's the Australian Botanic Garden, Mount Annan. So uh, known to the Durrell people as Yandalora, which means a place of peace between people. It was opened in 88 um, and covers 416 hectares of native um, native species with 130 hectares of remnant Cumberland Plain woodland. So another mix of, uh, of um, conservation lands and managed living collections. So it also ho uh, hosts the Australian Plant Bank and the, Australia, uh, the National Herbarium in New South Wales, which I'll cover in a tick. Um, and key collections here include the Asteraceae, Conifers, Fabaceae, Ficus, Malvaceae, Mataceae, Poales, Proteaceae and Laniaceae. And again, cycans here fall under the conservation research theme for this garden. So we include the uh, collections in Plant Bank as a living collection. Um, they're primarily wild sourced um, and it supports the living collections, the restoration of natural areas across the Botanic Gardens of Sydney. So they have uh, over 5,300 taxa representing 183 families and 5,000 species. 
Um, there's over 13,000 living accessions, 95% of these are from known wild origin, which is really important when we're using those in our collections. It's representing about 14% of IUCN red listed Aussie species, um, about 22% of EPPC listed species, and over 63% um, of New South Wales listed species. Now, just quickly, I know it's not a living collection, but the herbarium holds over 1 million plant specimens and a further 8,000 are added each year. And it's a really significant resource for the Australian Institute of Botanical Science. It's in, it provides an important foundation for the living collections for the Botanic Gardens of Sydney. It ensures that we've got accurate location and associated data for all of those wild source material that we use in our living collections. It's also very important for the research and international collaborations on, on this, uh, native species for Australia. So just quickly, um, the living collections, um, there's 11, this is just the Botanic Gardens now taking plant bank out, but there's 11,800 species across the gardens estate, 75,500 accessions that are represented by 12,500 species and subspecific taxa. And 2,700 of these occur across uh, one or more of the gardens. So we have various collection themes that we work towards and we're refining these in our living collection strategy. And these include geographical and ec ecological theme, taxonomic or evolutionary, conservation research, heritage, ornamental, cultural and economic, educational, cultivars, and dedicated trees. Now, of course, um, this is probably where a lot of uh, botanic gardens start, maybe not to the same scale. But really, it's those original capital works and the, the effort that goes into the planning and understanding what it is we're trying to achieve that helps to determine what we do with our living collections. So depending on the scale that you're working on, um, it can be often very expensive and time consuming. And these initial stages aren't always as, as good looking as, as what eventuates. But these can be what really lead to those inspiring moments. So the image that I showed earlier of Mount Annan, you know, it's these sort of initial thoughts that go into this sort of work of how we want to display and use the living collections and how we want people to engage with them. It's really important. So following on from what Emma was talking about um, with the Global Botanic Gardens Congress um, during that week, it really came out that the nursery is the engine room of everything when it comes to a botanic garden. And that's no different to the Botanic Gardens of Sydney, whether you're talking about this um, nursery at Mount Annan or the one in Sydney or the one at the Blue Mountains. Um, without a functioning nursery, there just wouldn't be a living collection. So it's really critical that we put time and effort into the nurseries, that we understand that communication is key, that we need to support our staff and ensuring that we've got adequate space and equipment for what it is we're trying to achieve and being realistic about what it is that we can achieve with what we have available to us. And this is where the collaborations with other gardens and building on previous experience can really save time and resources, particularly when you're working with species that we previously haven't encountered in your organisation. So once we've got the plants out of the nursery and into the living collections, they do provide a unique and safe experience for visitors and they're important for education and engagement. But we need to start thinking about what the cost of these are and how do we ensure we're providing the best opportunity for achieving our goals and our outcomes. And this will vary from garden to garden, even within an organisation. But it is important we understand this, including the capacity with which we have to operate within. So again, it's critical we invest in staff and their expertise, including the facilities they need to deliver their work. And that's uh, very true for horticulture, but also as we more and more move into conservation horticulture and including the cultural considerations that come along with what we're working on. So it's not always straightforward or easy, but it is essential if we want to achieve what it is we're setting out to achieve as a botanic garden. So some of the big picture approaches, like master plans, like this one for the Australian Botanic Garden in Mount Annan, um, this was just recently developed. These can be immensely helpful for attracting investment and supporting the community and donors and governments to get on board and see what it is that we're trying to achieve and support us to do it. But not every organisation and garden are ready for this step. Um, and like, like spoken about in the previous presentations, doing living collections Plans and strategies are a great way of trying to put some, some structure and form around what it is we're trying to do. Um, with us at the Botanic Gardens of Sydney, we're currently working on a living collection strategy and a policy. Um, and these are really going to be used to provide a shared understanding of where the organisation is heading and why. So they're becoming more common across the global network of Botanic Gardens. They're particularly useful for ensuring that we have a clear remit for how we allocate our limited resources. And that's true, like Emma said, for whether you're a small garden or a large garden, there's always the need for more money, more time. Um, and that cuts across everything from acquiring our collections, how we curate them and use them and how we share them. 
Um, so with ours, with the Living Collection Strategy and the Living Collections Policy, the policy will underpin the strategy. The two documents will provide the organisation with a clear direction of how we approach our living collections. And that's across both the seed bank and the gardens. Um, we'll be using that to provide a framework for what plants make the cut. You know, why are we including this in the collection? Does it fit with the themes that we're setting out for our gardens? And does it sit with our objectives and our goals for why we exist as an organisation? It'll also help us with how we manage them over time. Um, and you know, for any garden that's in the Botanic Gardens Network, inevitably you'll have requests for either sharing the material you have, or people would like to share their material with us, particularly those collectors that might have a particular interest in a species or a family. So something like the Living Collections Policy will enable us to make decisions around how we use and share and accept plants into the collection. So at the Botanic Gardens of Sydney, uh, the data um, is absolutely critical to the development of our living collection strategy. For an organisation of our size and age, it's imperative we have a good handle on what it is that we have in our collections, where they were sourced from, and where they're now located across our estates. And this is, it provides a really practical way for staff and visitors to use and access the material and the data that's in our collections. Um, so things like the Garden Explorer, which we have for each of the three sites, um, really provide that opportunity to, to get into the collections, find out where they are, and have a bit of a, a look around the gardens, uh, both online before you arrive, but also being able to know where to go when you get there. So the Living Collections and Records team have done a phenomenal job of pulling this information together, and it does underpin everything we do. Um, that's not just individual sites, but also nurseries and the Arboretta team. Um, the data for these collections used in conjunction with data from the seed bank and herbarium really gives us a chance to adequately understand, curate and share what we have. Um, and that goes right through the education, amenity, conservation and research sides of the work that we do. So a shout out to the team. They've just completed um, a stock take across all three sites. The domain is next. This is a really significant undertaking, but we now know where all of our accessioned plants are, and it allows us to go back and ground truth these over time. Um, it's, it helps us with succession planning, but also new gardens creation, um, education and scientific research across the institution. And as we start talking about conservation horticulture, um, this does extend to a range of different areas, whether that be native species or whether it be heritage collections from overseas. There's a range of different reasons why we might be getting into conservation horticulture. I'll just talk about a couple of those now. So one of the things that we can start thinking about, and this is a bit out of left field when you're talking about conservation horticulture, but using our, our spaces to do experiments and understanding what we can do. So this example is a collaboration between the gardens, Western Sydney Uni and Airseed. And this is looking at trialling seed establishment using drones. So these experiments, the experiments are important for that restoration side of things, um, but it can also provide data for gardens that have large areas that might need to be um, uh, restored. It could help us with those kind of maintenance of natural areas if the technology is going to provide what it is we need. But there's always areas where re-establishment in situ is not currently an option. And so this example here, um, where we use conservation horticulture to provide alternatives um, for our native flora, um, help us when in situ options are being researched and, and we're not quite there yet. So the Australian Network for Plant Conservation recently completed a safe custody for native guada project funded by the Australian government for Rhodomotus cityoides. This was a pilot approach to create those meta collections that um, Emma was talking about earlier. So uh, a lot of work was done around genetics and um, growing on material at the nursery at Mount Annan, and then that was distributed across a network, including Lismore, Australian National Botanic Gardens in Canberra, Blue Mountains Botanic Garden in Dandenong, um, and it also included supporting materials to educate uh, people on what it was that the project did, um, what it achieved, and what can be done in the future if we wanted to, to follow in these sort of footsteps and do more of the meta collection work. Another great example of this one, and Maureen's here working on the uh, Wallamai Pine, and this is um, a global meta collection uh, project that's underway at the moment, um, sending material overseas to the United States, to Europe, um, and on shortly to New Zealand, um, if everything goes to plan. So this is just ensuring that we maintain the species genetic diversity um, by having that meta collection spread out to areas that are suitable for the species in the long term. So. In these kind of examples, the knowledge and expertise and resources and the persistence that's required to do it um, is absolutely substantial. 
So being able to navigate the complexities from the propagation side to uh, dis distribution, understanding climatic envelopes and the potential for future change across the landscapes that they were sending them to, um, and the complexities for exporting material to multiple jurisdictions concurrently, um, as well as any of the other horticultural bureaucratic challenges that um, are present, really does push this from traditional horticulture into that conservation horticulture space. And it really does take a lot of effort across a wide uh, diversity of people. So even with all of this in there, there's obviously the challenges that we have that come with managing our living collections. Um, there's disease and plant theft, old age, climate change. Um, you know, I'm just going to flick through these slides pretty quick. Um, most people are aware of the fires in 1920. They had a huge impact on Mount Tomar. A lot of the conservation area was burnt, but there was a lot of the, the garden that was able to be saved. But some of the challenges that come Left field while we're trying to maintain and manage our living collections are these kind of cleanup efforts that come afterwards. Some of the, the challenges like the floods that um, the, the significant rains that came straight after the fires, you know, cause other challenges for us in managing our landscapes. There is always hope um, and, you know, Mount Tomar is continuing to improve um, the recovery across the conservation areas is significant. The living collections are looking absolutely amazing. I was only up there a week ago. Um, and they're moving into more of this conservation horticultural side of things, working with Camellia Arc Australia for a new Camellia garden, and also working with global conservation efforts for Nothophagus. Um, some of the things, the challenges we have also, obviously invasive species, many botanic gardens might start, particularly with um, the only available land you can get your hands on. So sometimes it's had other mixed purposes like agriculture, and it's had a huge issue with African olive that many people are aware of. Um, over time, you know, obviously, these things are, are very invasive um, and you can see the difference here just over 20 years, how much of a difference it's made to the landscape. And a lot of effort has gone in um, with mechanical ripping, poisoning and other things. But then also, once we've got those areas ready to go, um, when you know these weeds have been cleared, we need to make sure that we're working closely with our nursery from the beginning so that when these areas are ready to go, we've got that understory, we've got the materials needed to replant these areas. One of the key things I think when it comes to how we use our living collections and how we get the buy-in is those community events that engage the community to make sure that they're aware of the challenges that we have and the importance of, um, of taking ownership for their local areas, their local botanic gardens and the species that are important to them. But coming beyond that sort of, I guess, engagement side of things, particularly for you know, large gardens like Sydney, for instance, there's also those other ways of engaging that we've got to think about. They're the inevitable challenges that come with visitor engagement, concerts, events, and anything we need to do to raise funds to support the work that we do. So these do put major pressures on our sites, and we need to think about this when we're managing our living collections, how this will impact what we're doing and what are we doing to remediate them, and are we building those kind of costs and considerations in from the beginning. So these are just some fun examples. You know, obviously a lot of resources go into these kind of exhibits, but these are great ways of getting our messages out there. Um, a lot of the time, the message we're trying to get out are lost on many visitors. Um, you know, they might not fully understand the full breadth of expertise that's involved in the horticulture, taxonomy, marketing, interpretations, records management that goes in behind the scenes to make sure we can do what we do. And that's why we must include elements of science, research, education, engagement, interps, amenity, and capture as many visitors as possible to maximise the transmission of our conservation message. And it's all of us working together in an institution and across botanic gardens to be able to do that effectively. So again, a great example from just this year, the Flutterville um, exhibit at the Calyx, which tied in with World Pride, is a great way of capturing an audience and using um, an opportunity like that to really get our message out there about plant conservation. Again, engaging kids and families in the kinds of things you can see in gardens are all ways that are fantastic for using conservation of horticulture, um, display horticulture, sorry, to, to really show what it is we're trying to achieve. And of course, then extending that out beyond those kind of elements and reusing um, our living collections in, in weird and wonderful ways, giving them a new life beyond what they're doing in a display collection and trying to help people to understand that, you know, these are important parts of our life, both socially and culturally, but conservation is a key part of ensuring that we have them into the future. And of course, communications and media and interpretations are all, you know, events like this, work, workshops with um, the GANs are all important for spreading the message and helping people understand what we do. Um, and I guess my last one is always my favourite use of living collections, and that's to create those experiences that people can take home with them. So the conversation about plant conservation can continue beyond the garden gate 
and we can extend our ability to be those agents of change we talked about in Melbourne for plant conservation. Um, I just want to say a huge thanks to John Seaman for sharing some images with me today, um, but of course the entire teams across the Botanic Gardens of Sydney, they do absolutely incredible work and I really uh, appreciate them giving me the opportunity to support their work as we move into this next stage of our living collection strategy and policy. Thank you. Thanks, um, thanks, Damien, for sharing with us and presenting um, over the Sydney Gardens. Um, I just thought maybe we might take a quick break just for a few minutes, uh, maybe five minutes, meet back at 10 past 11, just so everyone can grab a, a coffee and then we'll head into um, some, uh, we've got some gardens, who, uh, three gardens who are going to be discussing their collection management um, with us and then some discussion at the end. But I see John, um, you want to add to that? No, no, I, oh. <laughs> I was um, just randomly waving. Oh. <laughs> my, my apologies. No, oh, good. No worries. Okay, I'll see everyone back in five minutes. So ten past eleven. Yep. Um, get back into it. I think. Um, hopefully everyone's grabbed a coffee and stretched their legs. Yep. Um, so we've got um three three gardens up next doing just a short five minute presentation for us um, on their um, collection management in their gardens. So first up um, we have Kelly Resigner from um, Geelong Botanic Gardens and um, yeah she'll be speaking to us all about Geelong. So welcome Kelly. Oh, thanks Sherry. It's really interesting to have you introduce me as you've probably got a little bit more of a grasp on our collection management here and where we're at. So please feel free to jump in any time if I um, go off course. So I'm Cal. I've recently taken up the position here as the coordinator of the Botanic Gardens, which is really dear to me. I was um, fortunate to start part of my hort journey here as an apprentice many, many years ago, um, done a full circle and have come back into this amazing space, which I absolutely adore and I love. Um, I suppose where I'll start today for my five minutes about the, the GBG and the collection is working working with the staff is probably where we're at at the moment and really getting an understanding of our staff here and their, their history with gardens um, and their collection management, um, I suppose, the interest. So that, that's been a great journey for me. I, I enjoy talking to people. I probably talk more than um, sit at a desk, which is my forte, but looking at you know, a relatively new staff in collection management and working through that together has been amazing. So we, we've done a few interesting um, uh, workshops I suppose and uh, we've had some amazing um, laughs and talks and uh, just all our our ideas coming together so the recipe here for Geelong is is really looking at our staff and and our resources and what we have and what we can achieve and we marry that probably in with a little bit of community engagement really working with the city here to open up the botanic gardens and get an understanding of, of what our residents think we are. So wearing those two hats, I suppose, of we're a botanic garden and we, we enjoy being in that space, but we're also part of a, a bigger picture here with the city of Greater Geelong and, and our residents. And I really want the residents' engagement. Um, I think that's that's really vital to all the messaging that we end up producing in our collection management documents, um, in our interpretation and our wayfinding is, is really in, engaging with that that greater community. And of course, all of that would be wrapped up within uh, a conservation message. So whether that's conservation of individual species local to the region, rare and threatened flora, whether we're working um, freely on our own in our little space here or collaboratively with other gardens, or maybe it's about, um, you know, that, that nostalgic narration that is around a garden of this age. Um, so our collection management policies, we sort of are encompassing all of those um, amazing ingredients, I suppose, and, and in a way choosing our own adventure. I think that's one thing that I'm really conscious of is about finding joy in what we do every day and having a, a set target and an ideal state that we want to hit, but also finding those moments where 
um, we can experiment and we can be a, be in tune with with our climate here and and what we can do with plants. But you know, have a bit of joy and a bit of fun in that in that space as well. So we're on a really interesting journey. Um, I don't have any pretty pictures at the moment. Sure, I, I did have one, but it's a it's a bit of a mud map uh, scribble journey, um, which I looked at again just before, and I thought, oh, I won't I won't put that one up. So hopefully, in in the next six to twelve months, we'll have something really amazing that we can we can share with with a greater audience. Um, yeah, so that that's where we are at the moment. I suppose um, one of the one of the staff members here was telling me that they they used to call it M and M. So there's a lot of mulching and maintenance. And if I think of a triangle and that, that larger part down the bottom, which is that maintenance and where we do get a lot of interest and a lot of expertise, I just want to push the staff and the, and the Geelong Botanic Gardens up towards that point of a triangle, looking at collections and, you know, some real, real deep um, plant collaborations. Um, I'm really interested in animal uh, health and gut health and plants and the relationship between those. And I think that's a really a great great example of, of um, extra institutions coming together and working to the greater good and how it all relates back to, to our lifestyles, I suppose. Um, so that's, that's where we're sitting here at Geelong. Um, it's an amazing journey. I'm so happy to be back and working with an amazing team here. Um, and hopefully, yeah, in the next couple of months, just watch and see what we, come up with. So that's where we're at. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you for sharing um, sharing that. Um, I'll get um, straight on to um, John Bentley. He's um, from Melton Botanic Gardens and he's just going to be sharing um, a, a slideshow, I think, with um, some of his collections for us. So thank you, John. Ah, thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. Um, we're a regional botanic garden about 38 kilometres west of Melbourne and we've just been responsible for making Melton bigger as Melton has been added to uh, the population of Melbourne. Um, so that's one good thing. <laughs> um, we, the Friends are celebrating their 20th anniversary but we commence discussing with council about um, various sites uh, to build a botanic garden within Melton. Well, originally it was to foster one and hope council would build it, but they didn't. So the volunteers came together, the community came together um, to develop a, a garden. And we got a grant and with through Rob Small did uh, consultation workshops and developed a concept plan. Now, there's about five pages behind the concept plan, but effectively back in 2006, this is what we drew as the Milton Botanic Garden. And it wasn't to be, uh, the community didn't want it to be a wholly Australian garden, being a multicultural area. We ended up with bed themes of the Mediterranean, Californian, South African, Western Australian, um, and overall a dry land sort of theme or a xerophyte theme, uh, and recognising what we had, what the history of the area was from um, Aboriginal use through to farming and, and other things and deve housing developments and things that had happened. So that, that set the way. And then we convinced council uh, in their next budget in 2007 to set aside funding to do the landscape design plans. Um, this is what the garden looked like in um, December last year. There's probably changes that have happened, but you can see most of the area now has been developed and we just have this little area in the bottom right hand corner uh, to finish development and hopefully one day get a botanic garden center in there. And that'll help us to achieve a lot of our long term goals, especially in science and education areas. So the botanic garden, um, we, we initially set out on those themes. The landscape design plans, uh, again, that was with uh, consultation with the friends and workshops. Um, set out the themes for the garden in terms of the collections and we've done things by regional areas so um, we have a significant indigenous vegetation so along the waterways it has to be indigenous vegetation as deemed by um, uh, melbourne water so we have ryan's creek that was our first project and effectively these follow uh, a time development as we circle through these 
Then we, our first major project was the Dryland Eucalyptus Arboretum, uh, a large indigenous grassland in there. Um, indigenous planting at the lake, we started on the what's the lake wall, it's a man-made lake, and now uh, the Lakers group has planted all the way around there of indigenous vegetation, including quite a things that have been lost to Melton uh, or are very rare and endangered. Um, 2015, we started planting the West Australian, South Australian garden, and that's the planning group for that um, split the collection up into bioregions. So there's a Geraldton Sand Plains, Esperance, we've even got a Nullarbor section in there. So it goes by bioregions. Uh, we did a Victorian Volcanic Plains garden, um, a Southern African garden. So there's a collection of um, the delimiting line to uh, uh, say where we go from a bit of Mozambique down south. Um, an indigenous people's garden where every plant has meant to have a known Aboriginal use. Uh, the bush foods garden, um, so it's that was a mixture of uh, traditional and contemporary uses. A Mediterranean region garden, uh, the mixed garden beds area, which is like a mini botanic garden, so we do a lot of education there. Uh, people who can't walk around can see all our theme collections in there. Uh, and ladies project, which we started at the beginning of COVID, uh, is an Eastern Australian dryland garden with bioregions divided up into bioregions from outback Queensland all the way down to the Mary Darling Depression. Um, we also during COVID got a, a $20,000 government grant to do revegetation of this small lake area on the south side. Uh, and that's a really good example of a lot of Victorian volcanic plains, uh, grassland and uh, trees and shrubs. And then our uh, project, which we're doing, which is a big mound of dirt getting shaped at the moment, is the Californian Central and South American uh, garden. Uh, so they're the collections. When we've moved, uh, so you can see in the middle there, that's an example of the master plan and the landscape design plans from 2009. Uh, when we come to each area, we look to um, see what the plant collection should be in there and refine it. Um, the, the council likes to keep the main paths, so those ones in yellow, we're not allowed to change those, but smaller paths like those little red bits, we can add things in and move things around. And when we come up with a collection, we submit that to council and it goes to their landscape architects and their environment team to have a look over just to double check that we're not introducing anything which might be weedy or anything, but we, we do our own check on that as well and assess it. So Mike Smith and Associates were the people who um, developed the garden plans. They've never developed a, a, a botanic garden before, so some of their plant choices were effectively turned out to be things they liked and were inappropriate. So we decided that when we come to each area, we will specifically look at the collection that's going to be there. And we get advice from maybe Australian Plant Society groups and experts, um, or we engage someone. So when we did the Mediterranean Garden, um, we engaged Kevin Walsh um, and he, he put the collection together for us and worked with us on that. But Kevin, we met um, back in 2009 at the Big Ans Vic networking meeting in Ballarat, and he really emphasised to us about the importance of collections and thinking about them and what you put together in there. Um, so that's a nice connection with Kevin. Um, so I'll just go through the, the first major project we did and give you some examples of how we're managing the collections that we've got. And there's quite a lot on that 27 hectares of land. Uh, the dryland eucalypt collection. So this was the first, first, ma first major project we did in 2010 when we commenced the working party. Uh, one of our members, David Pye, volunteered to be the project manager to oversee the project. 
um, and we partnered with the local Australian Plant Society, the Melton and Baker's Marsh Group, uh, for plant advice and site preparation. And we worked closely with council staff as well. Um, the original planting plan had uh, eucalypts from high rainfall areas right next to something uh, from a really low rainfall area. Uh, so in the working party, we put the proposition and decided that it should we should plant eucalypts appropriate to Melton's rainfall, which is about 450 millimetres uh, long term average. And hence we we called it a dryland eucalyptus arboretum. Uh, and David Pye, uh, the project manager, and Barb Pye, his wife, had run Suntuck Nursery for quite a number of years, and they had extensive knowledge of eucalypts. So they helped, uh, well, they really selected the collection species and the siting of the trees and propagated most of the uh, 600 trees at, uh, at their nursery, uh, which we got from a $100 donation, uh, where we bought 65 packets of, of seed um, we now have over just over 100 species of dryland eucalypts. Uh, the management plan is a two page document just about how to look after the collection and what major pruning plant replacement and what to look out for uh, is, is in there. Uh, we've a significant thing was that we registered the collection with Plant Trust and that's given us good kudos uh, with the council. Um, and with other groups, and we get uh, researchers coming out to look at the collection, which they can study in, in one place. Um, we've written two booklets. So the first one was about 2015, and the second edition uh, was released in 2019. But all the photos in there now are from the Melton Botanic Garden. Uh, we've also developed plant labels. So you can see an example of our, that's, that's our highest level of um, of label that we use. We've now recorded the, we had things on spreadsheets. We've recorded all our accessions now in Iris BG that we got a grant for in 2019. Um, and we're slowly adding photos, notes, um, rarity, uh, anything else special about the plant um, and do that. And we've, last year we made the collection available to the public by purchasing uh, Garden Explorer. Uh, so that's given an interaction um, to the collection with gardeners um, and visitors and other groups wherever they want to do it. And we've been able to upload our collection to BGCI. So we've had contacts from across the world with people asking things about our collection. So this is how something like Eucalyptus rodantha would appear in Iris BG. Uh, we have we've every part of the garden. Um, uh, we have every bed with a code, um, and that's that's been mapped across the garden. So uh, it's easy for us to add what's been planted, where and when, and the status of it. So yes. So that's that's been um, that, that's been a bit of work, and we've just had um, a volunteers uh, step up to do that, and a lot of self training really. So this is how the eucalyptus rodantha at the moment appears to people um, who look at it on the web. Um, you can see the locations of them um, and in the big blank area on the left, we will we'll add more information and themes and things. So if it's got an Aboriginal use that will be in there and various other things that um, educate about the collection there and people can click on those links um, to um, to go to Flora Base or Plants of the World online to find out more about that plant, but they tend to be a bit technical because that's how we verify uh, the names for our collections. Well, usually through Plants of the World online. Across the garden, we've got a number of um, QR codes that um, people can scan and get access to the collection as well. And that's worked when we've talked to visitors uh, because they often ask us what's in what bed and we don't know sometimes. So it's, it's a big area. Uh, we produce a number of reports for our volunteer gardeners in different areas of the collection, especially if someone takes over. So this was for Diane, who had um, offered to curate the Bush Foods Garden so she can get a plan of what's there. And I thought I'd finish with a pretty picture. Uh, that's in the mixed garden beds, and that's the um, 
Mediterranean collection. That's that's one little bed of about 30 metres by about 10 or 15 metres with a, a really good collection of Mediterranean region plants. Thanks, John. Thank you for sharing and um, jumping in today. Um, I'll just head straight over um, to Dale. Dale Ardvidson, hopefully I've got that right, um, is from Brisbane Botanic Gardens and he'll be sharing some of his um, collections with us today. So thanks, Dale, for joining us. Yes, good morning, everybody, and um, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I will apologise, my camera is giving a bit of a glitching happening today, so yeah. you're just going to have to look at my presentation without looking at me at the same time. Um, and I also would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands that we're meeting on today, both here in Brisbane, but all around Australia as well too, um, and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging, and also would like to um, recognise any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders joining us today at this meeting. So this is a very brief overview, which is going to be quite challenging. Three botanic garden sites here in Brisbane um, to give us a, a, a bit of an overview about where we actually are and um, what we're actually seeing here as well too. And what will be the, the best opportunities for us to, um, to basically um, head towards the future of what we're needing to do with our botanic gardens and um, also with our record keeping as well too. So a brief overview, um, we have three botanic gardens here in the city. Um, in right in the city centre, we have the historic city botanic gardens. Um, the site was commenced um, as a garden for the new colony of Brisbane in the 1820s and officially became a botanical garden in um, 1855. It's an extremely challenging site for us um, under very strict um, heritage rules. Um, one of the most significant heritage sites in Queensland since European settlement. Um, we've undertaken um, fairly extensive of tree surveys, but there has not been a census of the herbaceous collection in the gardens since 1997. So it's a, a huge task that we'll be undertaking in future to actually record that. Um, Sherwood Arboretum is our second botanic collection that was established in 1925, and it's a collection of around about 1,200 um, trees. And um, it um, was designed pr primarily to showcase and grow and explore using Australian native trees which in 1925 was a fairly new thought um, in both the world of botanic gardens, but certainly here in Brisbane. And um, what we have on this particular site here is a, um, an ArcGIS spatial database system, um, which um, will give us that information about um, what we have here, um, recording you know, spatial data, data sets, longitude, latitude, scientific name, common name. Um, and this information is actually publicly available. Um, to, well, anyone can jump online, um, Google um, uh, botanic collections of Sherwood Arboretum, and this will come up and you'll be able to click on every single plant or tree that's been recorded there and see it. Um, again, a fairly interesting site um, and a lot easier to record. Then we have the biggest challenge, which is Brisbane Botanic Gardens, Mount Cutha, a 56 hectare site that was established in 1970 and um, opened up in 1976. And the biggest um, challenge that we really have with all of these sites is notwithstanding that we have three separate databases of uh, historically of what we have recorded here, um, but the fact that we are the only capital city botanic garden that is not run by state government. We are run by Brisbane City Council. So anyone who's in regional councils will understand the complexities and the joys of, of the challenges um, in working within that particular field of what we're trying to achieve as what is a capital city botanic garden. Um, and of course, we all know these background systems here that we're all, our collections here, specifically at Brisbane Botanic Gardens, Mount Cuth, that I'll be looking at today um, under our, our all the, the general themes that are broken up there. Um, a quick overview. Uh, over two thirds of the site of Mount Cutha, the 56 hectare site, is devoted to these three main plant collections. Uh, by far the largest is the Australian plants collections, followed by the African collection and then the American region collection as well too. Um, and this is, um, Pretty interesting for us because many of these plants, certainly from the Americas and African region, were sourced from botanic gardens and other places from around the world when the gardens was first being established. Um, we have our thematic collections um, when it comes to things like there's no place on earth that looks like the rainforest that we have in our exotic rainforest, um, but it's a classic element of, of this particular site. And with our Japanese garden, the majority of the plants aren't actually from Japan um, or even from Asia that are actually used in there, and people recognise that Handroanthus in the background of that particular image. Um, the taxonomic collections, which was, uh, I suppose, the original heart of the gardens, but that really has diversified and changed over the years um, with our tropical gymnosperms, our plant families garden and our conifer garden, which was very much a core part of our educational program back in the 1970s and the 80s. 
not so much so today being focused on by the schools and our historic collections. We, we know that City and Sherwood are our, our historic collections, but how can a garden that was established in the 1970s um, be of, of historic note? Well, we do have plants that are historical important. Many of the very first um, plants of Bougainvillea that were grown here in the City Botanic Gardens that led rise to many of the cultivars that we use today um, we tra were transferred from the City Botanic Gardens to Mount Cutha when it opened. Our climatic collections, our tropical dome, wouldn't think you'd have a temperate region collection here in Brisbane, in, in very not in a temperate area, and our ecological and conservation collections, which we know we're all moving towards. But our actual biggest program that we're working on right now is the Living Collection Census for Brisbane Botanic Gardens, Mount Cutha. The last full plant census was um, undertaken back in around about 2010, uh, but it didn't really include a spatial mapping system at the time. So technology, of course, is allowing us to be a lot more flexible. Um, here's an example of, of just one of the examples. We actually use um, Gini for our main database here. And just to see the little section that you may be able to see at the bottom of your screen, when the data was first brought across from our access database, um, we had 51,547 recorded living plants um, in the collection at that particular time um, of previously recorded. Um, that doesn't mean that's what we've got now. Uh, we've gone through a millennium drought. We've gone through large scale expansions, not once but twice of this particular site. Um, and when we actually uh, started to um, record through and um, see what we've actually audited so far in just one full year, we're only up to 9,000 996. I say only, it's been a huge undertaking so far by our technical team to, to reach that particular level, but we've got a long way to go yet to really update that census and to record that spatially as well too. And for example, um, we all recognise these sort of pages. Here's a bit of an example here um, where you can see one of the particular species, the upper Wallastonia spilanthoides, um, and some information there that, you know, here we have a wild collected plant that came from up at Mackay um, and where we've got it in the collection as well well too. So really, it's a long journey for us to go. Um, just for many of our regional botanic gardens who think, well, all the capital cities will have all of this sorted out by now, won't they? Um, it's been a, a very interesting challenge for us to work. Um, we primarily have one staff member, um, our a botanic and tech technical coordinator, Ross, working on this particular project. So to get to 10,000 in just one year, when we've got one person really working on it, um, but also working with our very small technical team of just two people, um, means this is a huge undertaking for us to, um, to do this particular project. Um, so yes, we really have um, a long way to go. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dale. Thank you for, um, yeah, for coming along and presenting for us today. Um, so I'm going to hand over to um, John Arnott to have a bit of a panel discussion. So I was just wondering if everyone who presented today could just turn on their cameras and um, I'll hand over to John. And if anyone's got any um, questions, to either yep. pop them in the chat or, um, yeah, I'll let John run that anyway. So thank yeah, you. No thanks, everyone. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Sheree. I, I, I've got pages of notes and pages <laughs> of bloody questions. I wouldn't mind starting with Dale. Um, uh, I, I always forget that the Brisbane Botanic Gardens and the Botanical Estate at Brisbane is not a statutory authority like the rest of the Botanic Gardens in um, in Australia. I understand that all of the Botanic Gardens in New Zealand, the, the, the major Botanic Gardens are, are local government funded. But in, in Australia, um, uh, the Brisbane Botanic Gardens kind of breaks the mould. Um, so the question is, Dale, that, 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 and it was around some, something that um, that Emma said about this constant need for re-education and just redefining back to council what a botanic garden is. You must have to do that at such a high level. And are there any learnings at, coming out of a, a, out of Brisbane as to as to how you know regional botanic gardens or smaller botanic gardens might you know learn from your advocacy approach because you know, you, it, 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 anyway, that's the question. It is um, a, a very interesting circumstance. And prior to Brisbane, I was based you know, at regional, regional Botanic Garden in, in central Queensland. So I, I, I've seen both. 
I've I've seen both sides of it. Um, and 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 the reality is is that I think the most important thing is we often have a, a huge amount of support um, from our councillors. Um, we've you know recently received. We are fully funded by our council. We're not having to seek um, external funding to operate. We also um, have a, a very strong focus on, on renewal. Um, we've recently received a brand new bonsai house uh, from our council um, due to Law Mayor's funding. So we have a lot of support from the council, but I think it's something to be aware of is that not every councillor, uh, and you will all have portfolio councillors or councillors that look after particular wards or areas, um, may know, and especially after an election, if there's a new councillor, may really know what you are and who you are and what your role really is. And what you said is very true. There's an ongoing education program that exists, and I've presented to our councillors many times um, around the different elements of the role. Um, presentations are often very brief. Um, there's only so much information you can provide. And so it's providing different facets of, of who you are and never miss the opportunity to invite councillors of all persuasions to come to visit your different gardens and collections. They're very, busy, very, very busy people um, and they may only have 30 minutes or max, maybe a maximum of one hour and really just try and reiterate how um, vital your gardens are, how important they are for your local community and to bring visitor dollars into your local area. Um, but I think what you're saying is true in the, in the regard that Whilst um, on paper it may seem like every four or so years we have to completely re-educate um, our councils um, about the changes and, and who we are and what we are, but I think it's um, advocacy and sharing the information of who you are with passion is the ultimate gift that you can give um, cool. from your gardens to the people who may not necessarily know and think that the Botanic Gardens is just a pretty park that our residents enjoy. So yeah. never miss the opportunity. Um, please um, make sure that you're contacting via your correct um, um, connections, of course, to your 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 councillors and not just your own local councillor or your your portfolio councillor, but that there's opportunities to host meetings for all of council to really get to understand. And if you have volunteers and your local community based with your botanic gardens, um, they do have um, a voice and they do and they can share their passion and their support for the gardens as well. I'd, I'd love to. Thanks, Dale. That's 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 um, that's that's really perfect to to kick this off. I, I think it's an interesting theme. I'd like to really now bookend that with John Bentley from a, a an organisation which is um, volunteer based, and all the way to um, uh, Damien at the RBG Sydney. Just just asking the same question about the need to to. Um, well, in the first instance, it's it's John. How, how how have you gone about build, building that relevance to to council? Because I know you 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 really valued, and 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 Damien, you're not run by a local council. You're run by you know a, a, a statutory authority and a board. And are the processes that different? So maybe start with John. Thanks. I I really concur with Dale, and thanks for that succinct approach to dealing with uh, council. We've taken a very similar approach. Um, we originally, well, we've always had a council liaison officer uh, because it is council land and they do some support with us. But our council liaison officer back in about 2008, 2009 said you probably need to start attending council meetings to get to know the councillors and influence them. And so we know all the councillors by name. We have direct access to them. We still continue to go to council meetings. Um, it's been Jill and myself, or Jill and another member started back in 2009. I was working back then, so I had and, and John, for those who don't know, Jill is your your better half. Partner, pretty, yes. pretty much, yeah. And, and, and she runs the Lakers group. She joined the group probably about 2006 and said, if you're in this thing, I better come along and support you. <laughs> so, so that was good. And uh, she's really got involved in things. Uh, she's in the other room doing memberships at the moment because we're uh, we're up to about 400 and just a tad under 450 members. Uh, so we've got great support. And again, getting that out council, you know, getting even the Botanic Garden onto the council website and stuff, all of that. And we, we know people right across council. We've just now uh, we've joined the well, I, I joined as a member of the Arts and Culture Committee. So the Milton Botanic Garden is now one of the five places designated for public art in the master plan. And we've just had um, 
a plants and oil drum sort of thing is on display. And so that's initiated through working with council units. So, Perfect. so for us that efficacy, but we've always networked. I mean, BGANS has been a great network. We've been in that. We've now joined uh, BGCI and right from the start, we used uh, the Darwin manual, which was the BGCI publication from the nineties. And now the, the new publications about managing the garden, but you know, working with community groups, getting scout groups involved, school groups involved has just put the word right out there. So for Milton, there has been great community pride in just having a botanic garden. Uh, councils are seeing that um, it's generating income and visitors. And I just keep saying to, um, to the mayor, uh, the Milton Botanic Garden is the premier tourist destination in Milton. Yep. And I'll wait till she says that in a speech. <laughs> so yes. Thank, th thanks, John. It's and, a lot and, of hard and, work. And, and Damien, just back on the topic of, of living collections and and you know our relative masters understanding the the, the value of, of living collections. Do you think the dynamic is is different for a major capital city garden, which is um, statutory authority and managed by the board? Yeah. Thanks, John. And, that, and that's a question without notice because you've, you've only been there for a couple of a couple of months. It was probably <laughs> yeah. been mean for me to ask. Sorry. That's all right. I, I know <clears throat> intrinsically already, John. I, I know it all. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, look. From what I've seen so far, it's 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 really impressive the way Sydney goes about it. The way they have constant communication with their board members. It's a, a constant engagement um, at at a range of levels. It's not just through Denise, um, but through her staff as well. There's that um, ability to engage and and discuss what's coming up um, using their expertise across the different, um, I guess, backgrounds that those board members have and using that to help leverage what we need to achieve. Um, but what I think is probably also worth um, talking about is the, you know, then you have that layer of government as well. And we've just had a change of government in New South Wales, so having to go through that education process again and identifying what the prior priorities are for a new government um, is an interesting challenge that everyone would be aware of, regardless of whether it's councillors or, or otherwise. Um, but I think the other thing as well that I'd touch on is that Sydney's really putting in a lot of effort for reconciliation and trying to ensure that engagement with First Nations peoples across our sites is, is key to what we're doing. So there's a lot of consultation going on there as well. So it's sort of taking in a, a range of different elements and um, different perspectives in all of these elements of, of managing our living collections and ensuring that we're, we're talking to the right people at every level. Um, I think that's probably a, a really good takeaway. Thanks, thanks very much. Hey, there was a question from the floor from <clears throat> Bob Makinson, which was talking about Opportunities for publications for horticulturists to public to publish um, uh, uh, some of their observations, some of their collections, some of their, their thoughts and feelings. Um, but uh, individual gardens aren't really necessarily facilitating that or supporting that. Um, I know Beck jumped in. Beck jumped into the the the, the thread. But um, uh, Emma, the, I, I, any thoughts on 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 that as a, a mechanism for sort of retention and identity and yeah, um, growing as a horticulturist? Yeah, I think um, sometimes when we think about career prog progression, it's not just about moving up in, in the organisation. I think it's around building um, ability to communicate, give talks, write, things like that. And so um, I definitely agree with Bob that um, we would love to see more of our horticultural conservationists sharing their knowledge um, and personal experience peer-reviewed publications are not for me <laughs> it, it can be a difficult process to go through and so we don't want to throw them in the deep end too quickly so you know using your um gardens newsletter your socials your websites um is a nice easy step into writing um and then using the botanic gardens magazine through vegans or the anpc um, newsletters and and journals are kind of an, the next step um and there's also a great horticultural journal um, called sabalia which comes out of royal botanic gardens of edinburgh and it's kind of the next step from it um, to a peer review so you kind of get peer review but in a really nice way and so the, that's a great journal has all the kind of information that people in a botanic garden want to read and that's their core focus so there's kind of a progression I think there that we should really be encouraging and um, 
often think that if a mentoring program was established in through BCAM or BGANS wider or even BGCI, that kind of component should be an element of that. Beautiful. Um, so, so to you, Kelly, you were, you were, you were talking about um, growing people. Like your role is to as as the the, the leader of digital longer tenure is to actually grow people. Do you see opportunities in that in in that space, um, Kel? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think exactly what Emma said. The the even the, the confrontingness of sitting here in with a group of people that I am with today is is for me just I can't stop smiling and I giggle <laughs> to myself at pinching myself under the table and. Um, I suppose the, uh, what do they call it? Um, uh, where you just don't feel that you have those skill sets because the harshness of, of what has happened in the past or, you know, just the, the mind, what you have in your own mind is, is not going to be good enough. But I think breaking those boundaries is, is absolutely the way forward. So someone, an apprentice that is here for a month on our rounds that we have here at the city of Geelong um, wants to make a suggestion, make the suggestion without that fear of, of uh, shame or anything. And, and that can be at that level, exactly what Emma said, at a publication level, but it's the only way that we're ever going to get to a point where we're free enough and we feel free and safe. I suppose safe is the key word here yeah, cool. that we the judgment just won't stop us from uh, keep going. So yeah, I'm, I'm always encouraging and, and I lead in a way that, you know, footy mouth disease, hand up here, do I make mistakes? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, do I know what I'm doing? Not all the time. Um, <laughs> do I love being part of this sort of forum? 100%. Um, and I just, I keep telling people that it's, uh, well, a wise person said to me, I'm in a very privileged position and I agree with 100%, but I'm also here for fun and joy and I want people to love what I plant, mm. however that may seem. So growing people is is exactly um, why I'm here, yeah, and cool. and so it's sustainable. So it's sustainable too. So when yeah. I leave, or you know, when Cherie leaves, she's just, she's my idol at the moment. So I'm in awe of Cherie. She's an amazing person. Um, that something continues, and it mightn't be at the same passion level, or it mightn't be, um, you know, something that I I love, but it'll be something that someone loves. So it's a continuum. Yeah. It, it it's interesting that the um uh the theme of today has been it's, it's all about the plants but in the q a okay. it's it, it just seems that it's all about the people that that um it, it's about the people that that undertake plant husbandry plant curation plant collection management um uh I, 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 i'm not suggesting that anyone is asleep at the wheel but uh we have been talking about this capacity building thing for a long time and i think conversations like this are the informal learning um, but I'm just not sure as a sector across Australia and New Zealand that we've actually cracked something which is a bit more formal. Uh, I know it's on the boards, the BGANS boards uh, radar uh, to, 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 to address or, or at least to have a look at what some options are. Um, uh, and, and, and last but certainly not least, uh, I'm, I'm just going to throw to Andrea just to reflect on um, to, today the toolkit and I, I, I'm not advocating more scope creep at, at all, Andrea, but just any, the any reflections. Scope for good reasons. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. But I, I, I would just throw to you to, to um, just some thoughts and reflections on, you know, the conversations that we've had today around collections and the people that are managing. Yeah. Um, I think one of the big ones that's come out of today is um, I've been frantically making notes um, after John's talk about you know, I think the, what the collection toolkit is missing at the moment is perhaps a more thought around new gardens because for something like you, John, and the difference between establishing a collection in a landscape and ongoing curation, and I think that's something the toolkit, we are looking at, you know, different levels of management of collections. You know, you've got landscape displays that are beautiful and thematic and, you know, have some sort of priorities around them, but they're not where you're going to be putting your effort all the way through to conservation collections or um, First Nations collections that require a deep amount of engagement from the curator. Um, so it's just it's just reinforced that spectrum of gardens that we've already been talking about, John. 
And I'd love to get Damien's little definition of what a living collection is to put at the front of the document, if that's possible. <laughs> I was frantically <laughs> trying to type what you were right saying. So Damien, click that through. Uh, John Bentley, I don't know if you could recall the, the kind of the tiers that we that, that mm. were talked about in the first instance in mm. terms of pitch. Yes. Where, where do you think um, Melton would identify themselves in terms of a tier? Is it a I, tier I, one, tier two, or tier three? Or tier I four? did reflect on that during the talk, uh, and I put between two and three when I Good. looked at all the aspects. Not everything might be documented well because we we have now in our in our planning to go for BGCI accreditation as a botanic garden. Yeah. So we've been working through that. Um, but I, I hadn't come across that before, and I just thought, wow, that's really easy. That's the, the, you can, but it, the diff, the the different things that you look at, can you can slot yourself into those tiers very easily. It was nice and simple. I love that. Tick, beautiful. Good. And Three, I would, I, oh, please. And I would expect that any garden that's BGCI accredited would be tier three. So that's something to potentially work into that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just on the on the toolkit, we're 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 still sort of pedalling pretty hard in 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 the background. It, it's certainly a, uh, a 2023 completion project. Uh, we're not exactly sure what month, um, but uh, we are very very keen to to um, uh, complete the toolkit and and indeed roll it out through a potentially a series of of, of sessions uh, like this um, to be guided through the toolkit. I think is going to help a lot. Um, the, the other thing with it, John, and I know we talked about it informally, but we would potentially be looking for beta testers once it's ready. Sure. So sure. If, if you think you might want to have a bit of a crack at it, um, you know, so we can find the, the glitches, um, yeah, reach out to us. But maybe Cherie, and just, just to throw to you, maybe Cherie, we could, um, you know, put some communications out when we're a little bit closer and... Um, uh, you know, seek some people that might be able to, you know, put the before we go to to final print or whatever it is. It's not going to be printed. It's going to be web based. Um, but yeah, to take the ninety percent product and 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 test it pretty hard, that'd be good. Yeah. Um, th thanks, thanks, Cherie. Thanks, panel. Um, great, great discussion. Uh, I wish we had another forty five minutes. <laughs> Kelly, I want to I want to see your mud map. <laughs> I've just been completely <laughs> oh, ignored by Kelly. <laughs> you're on mute there, Kelly. And John, um, just Dale here from Brisbane. Um, one thing I didn't mention for everybody is like we ourselves um, don't have a formal living collections policy, so we're really excited about trialing and utilising um, the new toolkit uh, for ourselves here. Um, we have a we have a background, and we have certainly some really excellent collections here. But to actually put it into a, a formal process of of a living collections policy, we'd love to be able to trial that at a capital C level. I think that's one hand up for beta testing, Andrea. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. And, and something like Brisbane would really put it through its paces. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Yeah. Indeed. Thanks. Thanks, panel. Thanks, folks. Yeah. Thanks, thanks. everyone. And um, yeah, I think it's yeah, I'm pretty much on time. So yeah, thanks to all presenters for coming along today. So um, yeah, it was great to have everyone here. So um, any questions, you know, definitely email um, email me at BCAM and we'll try and answer them or pass you on to somebody who can. So thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, Sheree. Thanks, folks.